Hello and welcome everyone to this very special webinar on vascular ultrasound, which we are holding with uh, Julie Cardozo from Universal Ultrasound. Um, I am here in Vienna. And uh, Julie Cardozo, where are you at at the moment? I'm in New Jersey. <laughs> okay, so this is a US, USA, um, Austria production. And we're very happy that you all joined in uh, to, of course, have all of your questions answered. Uh, we got a lot of questions from you and uh, we prepared these questions uh, to answer them to your to, to of course to our best knowledge and actually uh, if you want to send questions to us we're very happy to take them as well you have your little chat box remember you can send us these questions and uh, we'll just feed them into this webinar as we go along um, i must be honest i'm not uh, anyone who's really very knowledgeable in vascular ultrasound i'm i would say more the moderator I'm someone who is more in cardiology, uh, but uh, I do hope that I can at least uh, moderate this uh, to your best satisfaction. And I guess it's time that I basically hand it over to Julie Cardozo. Maybe you can just uh, tell a little bit about yourself before we start going. Um, I uh, love ultrasound, been doing it for 15 years. I'm extremely passionate about image optimization, about answering the clinical question, why the patient is coming to the vascular lab. Um, so my intention is pretty much to help everyone that's listening today to get what they need in order to get the accurate information to help have the patient have the best outcome. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, Julie's been uh, producing content together with us. As many of you probably know, we have a course on uh, peripheral uh, vascular disease, the lower extremities now online, and we're working on more courses in the future. And uh, we're, of course, very enthusiastic because we do get very, very many, very positive responses from the course so far. Maybe I can tell a little bit of a story while we go along, but I think uh, to cut it short, I think we'll just start with the very first question we got. And it uh, uh, covers the topic of distinguishing between vessels. And the question was, when I'm imaging the legs and the vessels are close together, how can I accurately tell the arteries and veins apart? This is a question that was posted by Jody. So, Julie, what is the answer here? Well, it's important, first of all, that we utilize all the tools that we have on our ultrasound system in order to distinguish what vessels we are looking at. And what's interesting is that we have a great clip from our course where Susan and I discuss how to distinguish these vessels in the leg with color and with B mode. Okay, so we have this clip and we're going to show it to you. This is a, a clip that we uh, is in the vascular course. So you can also see um, how we produce these, uh, these lectures and uh, what the questions are that we answer within this course. So here is the clip. Now that my indicator is towards the right of the patient, I can clearly see two vessels in my image, one appearing to be the artery and one appearing to be the vein. How do I know the distinction between the two? Looking at the screen, we can see that the pulsation of the artery on the left, and there's no pulsation of this vessel on the right. If I ask Julie to apply some pressure to the probe, you'll see the coaptation of the vein walls on the right, and the arterial walls remain open due to the higher pressure. You can go ahead and let go of your probe pressure. Another way to distinguish between the two would be to use your color. You'll see the blinking of the artery on the left and the waxing and waning of the color on the right. Now I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and scan proximally. And as she's scanning proximally, we can see the femoral head. And you also note that the vein is bigger in diameter than the artery. So these are clues that you can use during your exam to differentiate between the artery and the vein. Okay, so that's a, a very good explanation. Maybe, maybe I can just add uh, the question to this. Um, is there also a way of uh, distinguishing just what is more medial and what is more lateral, or is that a very unsafe uh, kind of way of looking at it? Well, not naturally, the veins are more medial in the lower extremity and the arteries more lateral, but it also depends upon the indicator in which the uh, sonographer and which leg they're imaging. Um, so we always make it a clear point to put the indicator to the right of the patient so we know which extremity we're looking at. Um, and also the veins will always be in the medial aspect of the leg. Yeah, that's, I think, you know, I, I, I'm trying to make the, the kind of the corner to cardiology because 
there I do see a kind of a very important use, uh, and that is the puncture of the femoral artery during a catheter in the vein, obviously, and that is something that uh, helps us a lot. Uh, do you use that in a catheterization? Uh, is that something that ultrasound has a role in? Absolutely. Actually, ultrasound has a, a big role in every aspect. Ich habe keinen Ton, Moment. Um, I guess I lost a little bit the sound at the moment. Um, maybe we can get some sound back. Um, I, I don't know if you can guys can hear me, but uh, I can just tell you that, uh, you know, one of the major issues that we're concerned with if we perform a cart catheterization is obviously to create uh, pseudo aneurysms uh, uh, or to puncture the wrong vessel and maybe not even find the vessel. And, uh, you know, we use it very frequently in the setting, especially if patients have peripheral artery disease and we don't feel the pulse. Uh, but I guess it probably is something that you should use uh, more frequently in every patient, actually. And um, I think there's enough data out there to show that ultrasound is really, really important in um, using ultrasound uh, to differentiate which vessels you are. So, um, right. yes. I wanted to let you know that ultrasound has an, uh, a very important role for arterial and venous disease and the progression, and also is heavily utilized for the treatment of patients with chronic venous insufficiency, where they do endovenous techniques utilizing ultrasound access. Okay. Uh, one other question. Is there a difference in size between the vessels usually? Uh, for the deep venous system, yes. So particularly the vein is one and a half to two times larger than the artery. Um, but if there's pathology, then the, everything changes. So if a patient had a, a, a deep venous thrombosis event and they've had a long, long time, sometimes the vein diameter will always decrease in size and the vein walls will become thickened. So it's important to understand what normal anatomy looks like on ultrasound and also what the anatomy looks like, I'm sorry, what these vessels look like once they're affected with different degrees of pathology and how they okay. display. Uh, fantastic. We're getting some questions in. Uh, and uh, one of the questions is, um, how do we quantify, is it, or is it necessary to count the percentage of stenosis in artery, leg, foot? This is a question that came from Marina. Uh, can you maybe give us your take on this? Absolutely. Um, well, we utilize diagnostic criteria to calculate the percentage of stenosis in which would give us a diameter reduction. Um, ultrasound is great as far as uh, the accuracy of obtaining the peak systolic velocity. And uh, it's important, again, to utilize all the functions of your ultrasound system, particularly B-mode, because we are only seeing a two-dimensional view of what the plaque characteristic looks like, and also spectral pulse wave Doppler, which will give us the percentage. Um, I think it was our last webinar we discussed upon uh, calculating the pre-stenosis uh, lesion velocity versus the stenosis velocity in order to get what the ratio or percent of stenosis would be. Okay, well, uh, and that I think is... No, go ahead, Julie. Oh, okay. And also you want to know the effect of more distal to that area of the hemodynamics changes that occur from that lesion. Okay. I guess that really nicely explains uh, the question. I, I do want to come back to the issue of how do you differentiate between the artery and the veins. And uh, another question that was asked by um, Alton was, is there any specific spectral pattern for each vascular structure or is it only different in arteries and veins? Well, again, it's important to use all the functions of the ultrasound system, is particularly the B-mode. The B-mode function gives us anatomic landmarks to let us know which artery we're imaging in the leg. Uh, because pulsar sp spectral Doppler, the further you go down the leg, sometimes you know the, there'll be slight changes in velocity for our arterial flow, but particularly the human dynamics stay the same. Uh, for veins, as you go further down the leg, uh, the phasicity of the waveform decreases because you're further away from the heart. Okay, I understand. Um, a question that I have is, uh, do cardiac abnormalities somehow affect uh, these spectral flow patterns? 
uh, you know, what obviously I'm thinking of is patients with aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. Uh, do you see any differences there? I mean, I'm, uh, I don't know, but uh, do you think you can actually suggest that there is aortic regurgitation based on the flow pattern in the peripheral arteries? More in the carotid arteries for aortic insufficiency and stenosis, you can see it off the common carotid more in the lower extremity. Uh, what really does have an uh, effect on the hemodynamics is the venous system. When a patient has pulmonary hypertension or severe tricuspid regurgitation, the venous waveforms uh, lose their phasicity and often become more pulsatile. Okay. So uh, we got another question in. Uh, let me just let me see the question is, it comes from Edward Martin and he wants to know, do you ever encounter the situation where a particular vessel, in other words, the lower leg vein is not entirely visible? In other words, due to edema and what you do in this situation. So uh, if you're looking for a, a vessel and you can't find it, Sure. Sure. Particularly to the below knee vessels can often be tricky with uh, patients that have uh, severe edema or have uh, severe peripheral arterial disease. So again, there's different tools in our toolbox we can use as far as what the ultrasound system manufacturers give us as far as image optimization. But my go-to right away is changing either my transducer to a lower frequency transducer so I can image deeper, which would be the curve, the linear transducer or I would maneuver the patient where I can, if I have a, a bed at the facility where I can put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg, that will automatically increase hydrostatic pressure to dilate my veins, and which I'll see the uh, tibial veins better, my perineal veins and the anterior tibial veins. Or if I'm looking at the arteries, um, it will dilate these veins and the, the heavy calcified arteries will be easier to see. If you do not have access to reverse Trendelenburg position, you can also just have the patient just bend their knee and that will automatically increase hydrostatic pressure for the below knee vessels. Okay. Maybe again, a stupid question for me, but uh, are there certain patients uh, where you, they come into the, the lab and you immediately say, oh, this guy is going to be really difficult to image. Uh, uh, is there a kind of a typical, you know, appearance yeah. of patients that, you know, are going to be difficult? Sure. So again, patients would advance arterial disease um, that have gangrenous wounds. Patients would advance venous disease, uh, patients that have heavy edema, skin changes. Uh, the skin often is very uh, hard and uh, it makes it hard and dry. So basically patients would advance arterial diseases right away. You know, I want to use a curvilinear transducer. I want to elevate that, bend that knee, maybe put a paper towel underneath their knee to uh, increase hydrostatic pressles so you can image those vessels. Do you ever image patients standing up? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, if worst case scenario, you stand them up. Well, we actually stand all our patients up for our venous reflux evaluation studies okay. because we want the maximum hydrostatic pressure to see how the valves are functioning both in the deep system and in the superficial system. So we so kind of want to mimic their. Yeah, I, yeah. Just a question: I, What do you do as a sonographer there? Are you then on the floor, or how, how do you manage that? Well, I got to tell you, when I first started, I was on the floor with the machine and everything trying to get the end. So you got to do what you got to do. But now <laughs> they have, you know, step stools and adjustable okay. equipment to do that. Yeah, I guess but it makes when sense. When all else yeah. fails, put it on the floor, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to another question that uh, we prepared that came in uh, sometime earlier, and it was on the topic of deep vein thrombosis. And uh, it was a question, I guess, we just asked very frequently. And it's a question posted by Omlik. Tom, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. And the question was, what are the signs of DVT? All right. Well, there's two different ways you can define sign, right? So one would be uh, the signs that the patient presents clinically, right? So that would be perhaps uh, unilateral leg swelling, bilateral leg pain, calf pain. Um, so those would be the physical signs and symptoms that the patient would present in. But as far as the ultrasound signs, we again would utilize our B-mode color and Doppler to answer the question of whether or not this is a deep vein thrombosis and what stage it's in. Um, so for B-mode, we would go by whether the vessel is dilated. Usually the vein, as we discussed before, is 1.5 to two times the size of the artery. Um, if it's an acute event that just happened, that vein is gonna be really dilated 
and non-compressible. So the non-compressibility of the vein is the gold standard to rule out deep vein thrombosis. Mm -hmm. And then as you have that conclusion, you want to put your color on. And if it is uh, an acute onset of a deep vein thrombosis, there will be no color fill in the lumen. And there also be no spectral Doppler in that lumen. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, uh, DVT is definitely a topic which is uh, on the top of the list. We get so many questions in, uh, especially on this topic. And, you know, we do cover that very extensively also in the course. And I have to tell you a story. This is, uh, this is something that I encountered just um, a few, um, I would say, weeks ago. I have a colleague um, who's always asking me to come to a certain area of, uh, of Austria, which is in the mountains. It's in Schladming. It's a beautiful resort where you... I can go skiing and uh, you know he he's a, a big fan of one to sonography I must uh, honestly admit and he's been taking all of our courses and so I went there to hold an echocardiography course and he told the following story um, he had a patient coming in um, that was uh, had actually three or four exams of the veins uh, performed looking for a DVT because uh, the clinical symptoms were so typical of it and they were all negative and so he was there in this very mm. rural area and he uh, has an ultrasound machine and he's completely new to uh, vascular ultrasound. And he took Julie's course and uh, the, the patient came in and he said, you know, I, I can do it, but I've actually, you know, never done it uh, in real life. I'm just starting with this topic and I only have an online course, which I took. And uh, he discovered that there was definitely DVT. And so he was so happy, uh, you know, he sent me a mail and he, of course, uh, posted it uh, all over social media, which really makes us happy and it shows us not only that the quality of the courses that uh, Julie's producing is spectacular, but that it can actually, you know, you can actually really learn a lot uh, from online learning. So this is something that really, really makes me happy. Um, and um, yeah, it just shows how important this topic is. Now let's, let's come to another Absolutely. question that was asked and that is, um, uh, do you want to make a comment to, to, to that story maybe? Because I, I told you on the phone about this story and uh, yeah. Uh, you know, that right there is the reason why I do what I do. Um, ultimately, I want to improve patient outcomes worldwide, and, and knowledge is key. And, and again, I'm so grateful to be able to help that man and that patient. I mean, that right there is what I'm after, that fulfillment. Um, so I'm grateful that he was able to learn from me, and I'm grateful that he took the chance and took the course, having no idea what he was getting into, and for the courage to actually do it, you know, because it's one thing to have the knowledge. But then to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to try this. So uh, that just made my day and makes my yeah, year, right. actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does also for us. And, you know, this is so rewarding. And I, again, at this point, I want to thank all of you who, uh, for being in here, uh, you know, so ambitious to learn and to going on this uh, endowment to, to learn. I know that a lot of people who are actually in your course are people who come from other areas of ultrasound, especially cardiology, since we're very strong there. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a, you know, a great thing because the transducer can be used on all parts of the body. And, you know, yeah, I myself learned a lot. And I'm starting to branch out from echocardiography to other areas. I've not completely made it to vascular ultrasound yet, but I do hope that I will at some point in time. Um, but let's, let's now go again to another question, which is also in this whole area of deep vein thrombosis. And it is the question of what is the relationship between DVI and DVT? This is a question that came from Charlotte. Well, DVI stands for deep venous insufficiency. And as we know, DVT stands for deep venous thrombosis. So what happens is, is that deep venous insufficiency is caused from a, a thrombotic event usually occurring at the valve cut. Uh, and I have a really neat images to show you a great example of how a thrombus is uh, going through a valve cusp and the valve isn't closing. But right here, you can see in transverse view, there's a paired uh, popliteal vein, which usually occurs mid to below knee. Um, and you can see one of the veins is dilated with a little bit of echogenicity inside the lumen, and the other one is not as dilated. And the next clip you can see a little bit better. I zoomed in here and you can clearly see that the vein one is more dilated than vein two. Next clip. All right, it's a brighter one for you. And let's just go ahead and move to the next one where we show it in the longitudinal view. And as you can see here, uh, to the left of your screen is towards the head, towards the right is towards the feet. And you can see a free floating thrombus in between the anterior valve leaflet and the posterior valve leaflet. 
So this is a great example of how a deep vein thrombosis damages valves, which causes deep vein insufficiency. But also deep vein insufficiency can be caused from other factors as well, uh, venous hypertension, uh, trauma. Uh, there's a really cool image that I took with color flow, but actually this modality is called B-flow imaging where you can actually see, oh, here's another great clip of that thrombus that you all can get a better visualization right there. Nice. And then go to the next clip. So this is B-flow imaging, and you can see how there's insufficiency, the backward flow, of the bi-directional flow right there. And that's unilateral, right? That's all going towards the heart. And right there, no, nope, that's unilateral. Right there is the deep venous insufficiency. And you can see that was caused from the thrombus that was uh, going through those valves. So that valve is unable to close completely. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> well, I, I just got the statistics and we have uh, almost 100 people now on the webinar, which is really, really cool. Uh, you have mm -hmm. to know that this is kind of an exclusive webinar. It's not that we open it up to everyone, but uh, just to those uh, who we uh, have in this special club that uh, of course are, are either part of the course or uh, who are our premium users. So I'm very again thankful for these high numbers of people that uh, are in this and also many, many thanks for these many, many questions. We've got a lot of them already. Um, one is from mm -hmm. Mosen and he uh, wants to know um, what he said. I think he pre-sent that uh, question. Maybe we'll come to that later. But Ruchi asked the question, is it important to know the length of plaque or only its thickness? Well, plaque hacks, again, so ultrasound uh, is two-dimensional view. So what we always document for plaque is basically what it looks like, the characteristics. Is it irregular? Is it smooth? Uh, and is it homeo? Is it calcified? Or is it hetero? Meaning there's mixed um, gray shades within that plaque. Um, I always like to document where the plaque is located. So if I see plaque in the uh, common femoral artery all the way down to all the tibial arteries, you know, I definitely want to tell what the plaque characteristics are because it becomes very helpful to the interventional doctor if they're going to go for endovascular techniques. So they kind of know what they're getting into <laughs> before they go fix the patient. Yeah, so uh, definitely you'll probably describe that. And do you have any imaging tips how you can better visualize these plaques? Uh, is there something that might be of value to our, our viewers? Yes. Um, actually, again, I'm very keen on the three knobs that are, stand straight out on the ultrasound system, which are gain, uh, TGCs, and frequency. Those are my top three go-to. And then uh, also, if you are able to uh, maneuver the focus button, you're able to focus and add more penetration of the, uh, to the specific area of interest. There's also a couple things that we discuss and later on in this webinar, we had other questions come in regarding image optimization, dynamic range, and grayscale imaging can assist with that as well. But yeah. we'll, we can cover that later because a lot of questions okay. came in regarding image optimization. Okay. Another question that came in uh, was uh, from uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Ali Faiza. Uh, can you confidentially differentiate a new DVT in a vein previously having chronic DVT? Well, I mean, you can always have thrombotic, but again, with ultrasound, okay, uh, you, have, you have to know the patient's history, right, of course, but with ultrasound, we go by BMO findings, color, and Doppler. So if it's a new acute a deep vein thrombosis, it's not gonna be compressible. There's, uh, there's gonna be no flow within that vessel at all and there's gonna be no Doppler. As the vein begins to heal, right, the, the, there becomes more increased echogenicity along the walls where they become thicker and brighter um, and then lumens become narrower. So those are your key ultrasound findings. So just BMO color Doppler. If it's new DVT, you're not gonna get any compressibility at all. There's gonna be no color flow, no Doppler. As the vein begins to heal, you'll be beginning to get all those um, steps back, you'll be able to see the color within the lumen and you'll be able to pick up a low level venous flow that may appear uh, continuous, but phasic because it's in the healing process. Okay, another question uh, this time uh, from Galef. Do you give pressure values preoperatively for venous insufficiency? For example, the, Safina, the, the Magna Safina for 
um, uh, for all the vein system? We measure the duration of the reflux time and the diameter of the superficial system. So we, we have a thorough protocol that we do for venous insufficiency, uh, venous insufficiency pre-op, um, any endovenous techniques for the lower extremity. So we first assess the deep venous system to make sure it's patent, that there's no uh, active deep vein thrombosis. And then we stand the patient up and we assess the valves of the deep system to see if they're competent. And if they have insufficiency, if they do reflux, we measure the duration of the reflux. And then we assess the, the saphenous system, the anterior, the great, the small, and we measure the diameters at specific locations at the saphenal femoral junction, the prox thigh, depending upon what the physician wants. Uh, and we measure the, the, the duration of the reflux times at each segment, not okay. pressures, more the time duration and the diameter. Uh, a question from Nenat. Normal findings on lower extremities venous system is continuous flow. What do you mean when we have pulsatile flow without cardiac problems? Venous hypertension. Okay. Venous hypertension causes pulsatile venous flow. So that would be a pathologic finding and obviously indicate that the pressures in the venous system are high. Correct. Um, yeah. We've got a question no, from Maria. No cardiac, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, Maria asks a question, from a technical point of view, how can you document the direction of flow in the perforators and in the saphenum femoral junction during the venous insufficiency examination? God, these questions are, are getting more and more complex here. I'm glad uh, you're here to answer them. <laughs> no, this is great. I would love to talk to them over the phone and talk to them. Um, uh, okay. Julie, you want me to give them your phone number? <laughs> yeah, no, email, right? Um, wait, can you just ask me one at a time? So I know we discussed the perforator flow because we had a lot of questions comes in with that. And we have a great clip from the course that talks about how to get that information accurately. Because I know perforators are difficult to know what normal flow is and what abnormal flow is because again, the decrease of phasicity of venous flow as you move further from the heart. So we have a great tip in our video. Uh, that so we'll we come to that a little bit later. <clears throat> but what was the saphenal femoral junction one? What was the question? Um, maybe you can post the question to me once more. Um, you know, maybe we'll come to that a little bit later and just ask some of the questions which were pre-sent to us. And a question we have is, again, re regarding uh, the deep vein thrombosis. Is it true that an acute setting to exclude a DVT requires only ultrasound of the femoral vein and of popliteal? Pop a DVT below the popliteal trifurcation is relatively rare to cause pulmonary embolism? <laughs> um, well... So this uh, question is, is a good question because, you know, in acute setting of a deep vein thrombosis, you know, we encourage everybody to look at all the deep veins. Now, a high incident of a deep uh, of a pulmonary embolism from a below knee vein deep vein thrombosis, look, it can happen. It can happen, I think, more from a vein that's closer to the heart above the knee, but the chances, you know, it could still happen regardless of where the thrombus occurs. Um, so that's why I stress to everybody I work with and talk with, it's important to assess all the deep veins of the lower extremity system. Okay. Would you see larger uh, pulmonary embolism if it's uh, more central than peripheral? Listen, again, it depends upon the patient, right? What their their history is. Um, okay. Yeah, it really Could, just depends upon... I think it's just specific so to So you cannot patient. just simply there's, say, yeah. There's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, okay. it's not just, uh, you know, are they, do they have a blood clotting disorder? Are they in congestive heart failure? I mean, how long has the patient had the thrombus without being treated? I mean, all this stuff, you know, mm -hmm. dictates the, the event of how large it could be of a pulmonary embolism. Yeah. A so. question from Bismarck, um, Efa Nijamafa. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced this correctly. He, he wants to know, does an enlarged an inguinal lymph node together with edema suggest cellulitis? Well, all I can say is that venous disease is, is, is inflammation. So it has to deal with inflammation. I, I find, and again, you know, there's, there's documented scientific papers that can tell you exactly lymph nodes being directly correlated. But I can just say from my experience in dealing with patients that had advanced venous disease, there are lymph nodes present, but again, we can 
we can email this gentleman uh, some papers, scientific data that can get that answer for him. Okay, I understand. Good, let's come back to some of the questions that we had pre-prepared. Uh, and it is, how can we distinguish a partial occluding thrombus from a reperfused thrombus on deep vein on the deep venous system? This comes from Nevila. All right, so how we can distinguish a partially occluded thrombus from a reperfused thrombus? Again, we want to utilize all of our ultrasound functions, our B-mode, our color, and our Doppler. Um, we have a really neat clip here that we can show you that I took that can show you the B-mode findings where we can see a reperfused thrombus, a recanylated thrombus that is compressible with BMO, but you could see the web-like structure, as you can see here, the popliteal vein, the paired popliteal vein, it's compressible, there's web-like in appearance. And then go ahead, go to the next clip. And in this image, you can see that one of the paired veins is not compressible and the other one is. So one of those veins is still occluded and the other one is completely revascularized, recanalized. And then here you can see what color flow, you can see there's diminished color flow feeling. And again, you can see that web-like thrombus within the vein. And then with Doppler, you can see that the flow begins to get the phasicity back, but it appears continuous and it does augment. So again, indicating that the vein is in the healing process. Great, uh, so uh, you're really, uh, you know, answering lots of our questions from our users. Um, what uh, I do sense that one of the major, que most questions really center out deep vein thrombosis. And obviously this is a very important part of the clinical routine, as I guess you will agree. Uh, another question that came from uh, Nevila is how can we evaluate the volume of the thrombus in case of deep vein thrombosis to understand if the therapy with NAO is correct? Well, NAO therapy, again, uh, we usually surveillance these patients. Once they have an event, uh, they're placed on anticoagulation and we usually surveillance them one to two weeks uh, to see if the thrombus progress or it's stabilized. And then after that, three to six months. Okay, good. Um, let's now turn to the topic of arterial aneurysms. And there was certain a number of questions that came in uh, regarding this topic as well. And um, Alton wants to know, is the yin-yang sign specific for aneurysms? The yin-yang sign, I, I don't like to say specific for aneurysms. I like to indicate the yin-yang sign indicating a uh, Doppler shift, okay? So it's just basically indicating bidirectional flow. And we can get this in a normal vessel, but we correlate the yin-yang sign, particular for aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. And I have some really in interesting clips here to show you. Uh, actually, there was another question that came in regarding aneurysms, how to delineate between a true and a false one. Yeah, you it was from Paolo. Yes, and he was from Paolo, and he wants to know, how can I tell the difference between an aneurysm and a pseudo aneurysm? Yeah, that's a great question, because I know when I first started out in the field, I, I was scared. I didn't know. I was like, well, how do you know? So a true aneurysm is a dilatation of, of the walls uniformly uh, in a vessel where a pseudo aneurysm is particularly obtained through trauma. And you see that there's a little neck. Um, Dr. Bigger, maybe you can use the corner, just the circle, uh, the little neck there, right there, right? It has a neck and it goes into a pouch. So, um, and also you can see here the yin yang sign, which indicates bi-directional flow, means a, a, a shift in Doppler. If you go into the next clip we have, there's a better image of the neck and you can see the yin yang sign clearer. Next one. Yeah, I do hope I'm always pointing to the right uh, position. If you yeah. think yeah, you need some correction, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad to learn from you. <laughs> no, no, you're doing great. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next image. Uh, there's an image of this vessel in longitudinal view, and you can see clearly the true artery um, that is not aneurysmal. And then you can see the neck that's going into a pouch where that's the pseudo aneurysm. Yeah, I mean, um, can you? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there's flow in that neck, and it's flow bidirectional flow, meaning flow to and fro the the an pseudo aneurysm and into the vessel. So that's also another indication. Again, I'm a big fan of B mode, color, Doppler to prove our point. Good. So uh, let's come uh, to another question that was uh, posted. Uh, and that is uh, from Mosen. He says, what is step 
what is steps for scanning lower limb arterial walls? How can I say that the lower arterial vessels are intact? Okay, uh, well, the best thing I do is I follow the protocol, BMO color Doppler. So I wanna assess all the below knee vessels with those three functions, okay? And incinate them one at a time. Uh, document with B mode, then with color, and then with Doppler. Okay, fantastic. Now let's turn to the topic of image optimization. Again, we got a lot of questions. Uh, this is a question from Liesl, and she wants to know, what is another like way to improve the grayscale image if adjusting the gain and the TGC does not help? Yeah, and this will answer the question that we got before from uh, one of our viewers. Uh, again, I typically always go to those three functions, uh, BMO, uh, gain, uh, TGCs, and frequency. But there's other techniques that we can use, dynamic range and, and change in our grayscale uh, gray maps, in which Susan, our ultrasound specialist, discusses in this clip. Okay, so here is the clip. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the dynamic range. If I increase the dynamic range, this will display a broader range of shades of gray. This gives the image an overall smoother appearance. This might be helpful when trying to image pathology, such as thrombus within an artery or vein, dissection flaps, and fibrin strands. Lowering the dynamic range will give more contrast to the image. This would be helpful when trying to identify the adventitia of the artery or the vein. Grayscale maps will be used in conjunction with dynamic range. While dynamic range will increase or decrease the quantity of shades of gray displayed on your image, the B-mode maps will allow you to change how bright the stronger echoes will be displayed and how dark the softer echoes will be displayed. Your ultrasound system has various grayscale maps to choose from. Adjusting the grayscale maps will assist you in differentiating between separate anatomic structures. Let me demonstrate how this works. I have six grayscale maps to choose from. I'll scroll through each one and you can see on the image how it changes the appearance. Okay. Now starting with gray map D and ending with gray map J allows me to see the blood flow within the vein. Okay, fantastic. This is, uh, I think this explains it. Do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I mean, again, it's important to utilize all the function that the ultrasound manufacturer puts out for us. Um, frequency, grayscale, maps, anything and everything you got to do to get the image you need. Um, use those tools. And if you can't use those tools, pull out another tool, low frequency transducer, um, uh, the patient maneuvering. Uh, increase hydrostatic pressure. Sometimes you want to scan a patient, whatever you got to do to get a clear image. Um, but most of the time, these functions will get the image you need, get bezel clarity. Fantastic. Uh, we'll come to the next question. This is again a question which was asked live from Dr. Aftab Hayat Malik. And um, he wants to know how are varicose veins presented in ultrasound? And then he also makes a very nice comment. Love you guys. So thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Aftab Haya. Um, we love you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so again, when imaging uh, the venous system, we wanna look with B mode uh, to know anatomically where we're at. So we wanna start with the saphenous vein as our, as our point of of, of intonation. So we, we're, there's within the saphenous vein is housed in the superficial. So the superficial fascia to the top of the ultrasound screen is called our superficial compartment. And in that compartment above the superficial fascia to the top of the screen of the ultrasound system is where you would see the bulging varicose veins on the patient's leg. And we call these tributaries. Below the muscular fascia towards the bottom of your ultrasound screen towards the control panel, that's called your deep venous system. Um, so uh, the, below the deep fascia, that's where all the deep vessels would be, your femoral vein, uh, any perforators can come across that. But the most important is know the superficial fascia to the top of my ultrasound screen where my transducer is on the patient's skin is where I would find my tributaries, uh, which are the varicose veins that you would see on the patient's leg. 
Okay, wonderful. Uh, we've got so many questions coming in. Uh, you know, I do want to give everybody a chance to get the answer to the questions. And so um, I'm uh, happy to pitch the next question to you. And this is from Consult uh, Davak. It's actually an email address uh, at AOL.com. And the question was, what are the expected changes that you can see on ultrasound after extensive closure of the superficial veins to treat varicose veins? And also, do all leg veins, superficial and, uh, let me read the question again. Um, can I see the question? Uh, do all leg veins, superficial and deep, have valves? So let's start with the first part of the question. Uh, what are the ultrasound findings of a vein that was previously treated either with ablation or stripping or a pulpectomy or a sclerotherapy? Uh, depending upon how far out the patient is, will, the veins will present differently. So typically a patient that had an endovenous uh, treatment with heat or uh, their veins would present with low level echoes, non-compressible thickened walls. As it progresses, the vein begins to heal and it becomes smaller in diameter and the echogenicity becomes brighter. Um, it would still be non-compressible, but over time, say six months to a year, depending upon how large the vein was, that vein could be hypoplastic, meaning smaller in caliber, or aplastic, where it doesn't exist at all. Uh, we've seen with patients that had uh, vein ligations where they actually take the vein out from the groin to the ankle, where the vein is not there, but they have these little veins within the sheath where it houses the great saphenous vein. Um, the second part of that question would be always assess with color too, so BMO color, Doppler. So see if the vein has flow in it, and then also see if Doppler presents spectral Doppler in the vein after it's been treated. Uh, do all valves, do all the veins have valves? Yes, both the deep and the superficial system have venous valves. Um, the superficial system has more valves than the deep system because the blood flow direction is superficial to deep. So we need all those valves um, to get the blood flow back into the deep system. And then once we get up into uh, the groin, pelvic area, and the IVC, it changes. Uh, fantastic. Um, we've got another question that we prepared up front, um, was sent to us from uh, Youssef, and uh, it's again on the image to topic of image optimization. I often have trouble obtaining a waveform when imaging perforators, do you have any tips to give the waveform more clarity? Yeah, I love this question. So this is, you know, perforators can be really, really, really tricky. And uh, again, we get this all the time. So I thought it was so important that we, we took advantage of this question and put it in the, in the actual course. And here's a great clip where uh, Dr. Fedor Lori and I discuss how to uh, get perforator waveforms. Okay. So uh, here's the clip. You can appreciate that the flow in the perforator is different than in superficial vein, but at no point does perforator flow go in the reverse direction for longer than 0.5 seconds, which means that this perforator, despite the size, is competent and provides most of the flow into the deep system. I also like the uh, augmentation maneuver you told the patient. What exactly did you have the patient do in order to get this waveform? It is difficult to augment floor at that area. So one of the maneuvers you can perform is asking patient to move their toes, which activate the muscle pump. And you can see the floor pattern in the perforator during exercise simulating walking. Okay, so, uh... Fantastic. Uh, I think this, this clip again shows very nicely uh, what, uh, what you should do in such a situation. Uh, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, I, that pretty much covers it all. I mean, that to me uh, it was the hardest part is uh, the toe wiggle will put, pick up normal flow. And then also I augment the venous plexus of the foot, uh, which is uh, on the bottom of the patient's foot. You can press and augment that and that can help you pick up flow. But basically I found that the toe wiggling technique is the best to delineate normal and abnormal perforator flow. 
Okay, well, fantastic. I think uh, we've uh, got a lot of uh, uh, additional questions. Uh, we're running a little bit low on time, but I do want to say that we already have, you know, far above 100 uh, viewers here. So the numbers have actually been increasing and not dropping, which is a big compliment to you, Julie. Uh, there's more and more interest in this. And we do see that there's a practically no drop off rate, which also shows us that maybe these topics are of interest to you. You know, I've definitely learned a lot from uh, what I've uh, seen so far. Um, I think um, what, what is very important uh, just to, to mention is that, uh, you know, this, this whole project of one to sonography is obviously something that uh, is uh, both on, of course, my end, as you heard before, on uh, Julie Cardozo's uh, mind. And we, we definitely want to expand this project. And, you know, we know that we are at this point are only now at the area of the uh, lower extremities, a very important topic, but that we're definitely also going to add other topics to this. And, uh, you know, we've got visceral, we've got uh, the upper extremities, we've got the keratis. All of these are very, very important topics uh, that we believe that we should also cover in ultrasound. And, you know, we've uh, started 2009. We are a company that started basically with echocardiography as the main topic because that's my area of competence. And now we're branching out. And for those of you who are interested, we have a huge uh, selection of courses. We've got 14 courses online ranging from emergency ultrasound to abdominal ultrasound. We have the vascular now. We've got even pediatric ultrasound and uh, various courses in the area of cardiology. And uh, what is also very important to us is that you know, we, we see this whole project as uh, an educational project, not only in providing and pushing, you know, video lectures to you, but we also want to create new forms of, um, of teaching. And one of the things that we've really, really noticed is that a lot of you out there have uh, sometimes not the time to really study extensively and uh, time to sit down and watch, you know, extensive courses. So we also want to provide what we call micro learning. And uh, micro learning is something that is very convenient to do if you're maybe somewhere on uh, the bus or if you're going to work or maybe even if at work. And uh, the, some of the products we have, you know, are, are, might be really of interest to you. Uh, first of all, if you go on Facebook, you will find us there. You will see a lot of echo clips there. We're going to add some more content there as well. Uh, we just recently acquired a, a, a web page in the US, uh, which is called Sona World. And we're in the midst of rebuilding this as well. And we're going to have more content there as well. We want to make this a little bit the base, home base for everybody who is in ultrasound, where they can get the latest information, where they get information on technology. And even more important, uh, discuss topics which are relevant to you in your profession. Uh, may it be, I don't know, back pain or uh, musculoskeletal pain you have during imaging or it might also be you know where can I find a job or uh, how can I get training and uh, other issues that are on your mind so this is kind of uh, part of the the idea that we have in forming a community and uh, one last thing that I do want to mention as well is we have an app uh, it's called the ace of hearts so very easy to remember it's the ace of hearts card and you can find it both on the app store and uh, you can also find it on the um, um, the uh, Android uh, store and it's basically uh, a game it's for free you can download it and you can play against others it's in the area of cardiology and maybe Julie at some point will also have vascular uh, topics in there as well so this is something we might discuss uh, but definitely it's something that uh, it's important. Um, so uh, we actually have a very short promo for this and maybe we can just play that. So this is a, maybe a little bit of advertisement here as we go along. Um, Julie, I think we have, uh, do you think we have time for one more question? Sure, and also I want to let the viewers know that we have tons of questions coming in. and I'm going to do my best to answer every single one of them and hopefully get to these people via email shortly. Yes, so uh, if you have more questions, uh, just send them to us. It's just very important that when you send them to us, also add your email address where you put the name. Uh, that will give us a chance to answer your emails. Uh, again, uh, we'll be holding these webinars in the future as well so you'll have other opportunities to get in touch with us and and uh, ask questions and maybe i think we should answer one more question that came up and uh, the question came from kylie and is a uh, follow-up to the last question can you clarify why it is more difficult to obtain a waveform in the perforators to 
just because uh, the venous flow, the phasicity of the venous flow diminishes the more distal you go down the leg. Um, and it also depends upon the patient's hemodynamics. It depends on hemodynamics as well. Okay. There's so, a lot of factors that go into it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, I, I do see from the questions coming in that there's a lot on the topic of carotid arteries, which is also a topic which interests me very much because uh, it's close to closer to the heart than the peripheral arteries uh, and it's on the carotid imaging and so one of the questions that came in was uh, which views would uh, should I take in order to document internal carotid artery and this came from Owen. Hi Owen, uh, again I follow a particular protocol as you can see we have some great clips here. I always do transverse view of B mode and longitudinal view of B mode to uh, visualize the whole uh, carotid artery system, the common carotid, the bifurcation, and the internal and external carotid artery. Then I use color and Doppler. So this clip right here, we're looking at a transverse view of a sweep of the common carotid into the carotid bifurcation, into the internal, internal and external carotid artery. And here's a longitudinal view of the internal carotid artery. And right here, we wanna look particularly at the plaque characteristics and see what they are. And then we utilize color to see if there's any aliasing and, and what the diameter reduction is of the obstruction from the plaques. And then we take pulsed spectral Doppler to assess the degree of stenosis. As yeah, so it's a guess. And then I usually do a walkthrough. I do a couple, right, a couple samples to see what the highest velocity is, both peak and end diastolic. Again, there's different criteria that's published um, that's out there that we go by as a reference in which we'll discuss uh, when we do our course. Yeah, that uh, actually brings us again to uh, the topic of keratids and uh, expanding on the topic of vascular ultrasound. Uh, so this is something that we're planning now in the future. So this is uh, something which is, uh, we're very exciting uh, to of course produce this course as well. Good. Uh, so. Um, I think we have time for one, one last question. Uh, I think we should, uh, of course, answer this as well. This comes from Nevila and it's, in the case of the presence of a plaque in the carotid artery, how can we evaluate the progression of atheromatosa in case of non-stenotic lesions? Well, there's different guidelines set out by the organizations, um, particularly um, SBS has a standard of care where you want to assess the patients that have a percentage of stenosis uh, yearly or if their symptoms, if new symptoms arise. As far as the, the plaque characteristics, um, usually we just document B mode um, color and the effects of the hemodynamics, uh, the characteristics of what it looks like, whether it's irregular, smooth, um, if it's calcified, uh, if it's homeo. Uh, that's particularly how we surveil the patients. Okay, but so we surveil more if they're positive percentages than plaque. Right. I think, you know, the topic of carotid arteries is certainly um, um, much more than we can present in these two questions. It's a, it's a wide topic, of course. Uh, you know, I I'm definitely think that if you were already on this track of looking at vessels, especially peripheral arteries, and then you have, of course, an advantage of learning the carotids as well. And I also believe that, you know, for us as cardiologists, this is a very important topic and obviously will include, you know, issues such as the intermediate thickness and, uh, of course, how the correlation is with coronary artery disease and stuff like that. So this is going to be a very important part of this course uh, going forward. Um, I, I do think, however, that, uh, you know, we've um, at least um, answered most of the questions that we, we got from you. I know that there's uh, some other burning questions, uh, but I, you know, I think at this point, I I think we should thank all of those viewers who were with us and who asked all oh. these questions and for staying with us and a uh, particular big, big thanks to Julie uh, for being with us and answering all these questions. Uh, and yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful to be here and I want to answer everybody's questions. I wish I could be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, take care. And um, hope to see you soon in either one of our next courses or in one of our next Q&A sessions. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.